Hi kids! This is Eric with another science quest for you. Today we're interviewing Dr. Molly Gadler-Smith. She's an NSF postdoctoral fellow in the Lauder Lab at Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. I'm doing well. Yes. Um, I should also say that you're a marine biologist, so the kids know that what you're actually studying. Um, for this <laughs> yeah. series, we are talking to scientists about their careers. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, what does a marine biologist do? Sure. Um, so in general, a marine biologist is someone who studies uh, anything that is related to the ocean. Um, it can be things that are living within the ocean itself or um, the actual ocean, so like ocean currents, um, air flow around the ocean, uh, pretty much anything that involves anything with the ocean. The ocean. And what do you particularly study in, uh, in your career? Yeah, so I have a PhD in marine biology, um, but I'm really interested in studying a lot of uh, the organisms that live in the ocean. Um, and so I consider myself to be a functional morphologist. And so a functional morphologist is someone who's really interested in how the structure of something suits its function. Right. And so I'm really interested in the internal anatomy and physiology of different sea creatures and how the um, internal structures, like their organs, um, their tissues, enable them to live in an environment like um, the aquatic one. Right. So for example, why, why fish, like uh, different things like whales, are streamlined, like why they actually acquire those traits over time, right? Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I, as a functional morphologist, like I said, I'm really interested in studying the internal anatomy. And so over the years of my career, I've studied many, many different tissue from many different types of uh, marine organisms. And so what I have pictured here are many of the different types of specimens that I've looked at. So I've looked at adipose tissue or fat, um, specifically from marine mammals like seals and whales. Um, also um, from seabirds like penguins uh, and also sea turtles. And so what I'm really interested in looking at is how the tissue itself enables animals to live in the aquatic environment. And so specifically for these types of animals, because they breathe air, we're really interested in how gas is exchanged within that tissue to allow them to um, do their prolonged deep dives. So for instance, an animal like um, the beaked whale can dive for almost two hours at about 2,000 meters in depth. So it's really fascinating to see what makes up an animal is actually what is helping them to uh, physiologically survive in the aquatic environment. So when you're studying the tissue, are you studying tissue from their lungs or from the outside, the external layer of the, of the animal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for me, I actually take tissue. I'm mostly interested in adipose tissue, so that for mo many of these animals is considered blubber. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take uh, samples of the fat, which is the layer for most of them right underneath the skin, and do a lot of different uh, biochemical and chemical analyses to kind of look at how that tissue is structured um, within each animal. Uh, yeah, so we, we do a lot of tissue collection, um, so I've been involved in a lot of strandings. So that's when an animal <clears throat> will beach itself. And so we utilize all of these animals that have um, died to learn more about their biology. Uh, right. So we take a lot of samples from these. Me, in particular, am interested in adipose tissue um, and also muscle, um, just to kind of see biologically how these animals are built, um, because they're they're very different than you and I. Uh, we obviously don't dive in the water for very long periods of right. time. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how uh, anatomically and physiologically these animals are built differently. Again, that enables them to live in the aquatic environment. Right. 
As a marine biologist, what is a normal day in your career life? Yeah, so as a marine biologist, my normal day can differ drastically, but um, usually it involves being in the lab. Um, depending on what I'm doing, I'm processing lots of tissue. And so this picture down here is me using a specific instrument um, to process. This was actually the adipose tissue. Um, I'm creating different sections so we can stain them for different um, anatomical structures like blood vessels um, and different kinds of cell uh, types. Um, this picture here, uh, I actually also have done a little bit of um, human anatomy. So we had to be very, uh, we had specific um, PPE or protective equipment that we had to wear when we were dealing with human tissue. Um, so this is just me and my normal scientific lab get up. Um, but then uh, these pictures over here are what's really interesting about um, being a biologist because I feel like not only do I get to study um, marine animals in their own environment and study their own biology, but uh, I also get to work with other scientists like engineers uh, to create different things that can help um, human in, humans in their everyday life. And so when I was studying the muscle of stingrays, we were actually working with engineers to build an underwater autonomous vehicle. So that's what this is down here. This is um, a manta bot. And so what they did is that we studied how manta rays swam in the aquarium. We also looked at their muscles and then engineers took all of that biological information and created this robot that mimicked a uh, stingray. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's really cool because I'm not an engineer, so I'm not really sure what goes on behind the scenes of creating a robot, but it's, it's cool to be a biologist that's also working with engineers to build things like this. So these um, robots, these robots are, I've been reading about, actually I've been reading about manta bots and, so, and things that recreate natural motion of like uh, animals in the ocean. And it has to mm -hmm. do with, uh, they're almost going to be like drones, right? To gather information yes. about the ocean, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So I think right now um, there's this manta bot here. Um, they also, this was at Virginia Tech and University of Virginia. Um, they used uh, jellyfish to, to mimic because it's a different type of swimming. So stingrays, yeah, exactly. So stingrays swim like with an oscillatory is what we call it, uh, motion, kind of like a bird flapping. But these are, um, they, propulse so they like they propel themselves through the water jet much power. differently yeah like a jet propulsion and so these biologists are really interested in studying that type of swimming obviously this robot is much larger than uh, a normal jellyfish well <laughs> but they I think they <laughs> well I guess yeah yes, the big ones. Can get pretty big yeah um, but this is actually just like so this robot is covered in like a silicone structure there was actually a, a cover that went over this so this is kind of like the internal structure of the robot um but what yeah are you so doing, what are you doing in this picture you're you're pro you're uh you're trying to get it to <laughs> so this malfunction is me? <laughs> no. so this is actually me turning it on so it had like a magnetic uh instrument so that's just me turning it on but oh, they wow. actually had to like get six different undergrads to come in and like lift it up and put it into the pool for it to kind of swim we, it's actually kind of funny because we were on two different teams of the Navy. Um, so we had like a robo jelly team and a manta bot team. And we always were saying, oh, our, our robot is so much better because it's untethered and it can swim by itself. You can hold it in your hand. Whereas the robo jelly was a little cumbersome and needed a lot of people to get it running. Um, but <laughs> that's always like our science competition. So we have these like fun competitions between like engineers and biologists like which robot is going to be better but as i was saying um there's actually a lot of interest in research these days and looking at um, underwater vehicles essentially to send these animals or robots in um, to scope out underwater areas instead of sending uh, humans and so i think what I know currently is that they've got robotic tuna, they've got the manta bot, they've got jellyfish, they're working on a sea lion. Um, wow. And so they're kind of like encompassing like lots of different types of marine animals. So I think it's, I have it's seen really the tuna. cool. I've seen the tuna on some science. I've seen the tuna one on some science things. It's pretty incredible. I mean, the whole point, of course, yeah. uh, to get you to understand 
the reason why you're making these is because animals will react differently to them than they will to humans, right? They'll try to, it'll be like a more natural uh, sight for them in their environment, you know, than, than having a human just flapping all over the place going in, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the whole exactly. point. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great. So this is my normal day um, when I'm in the lab, but sometimes we do stuff in the field. And so I had the opportunity to work with some colleagues to tag basking sharks in the Bay of Fundy, which is um, a small bay that's north of Maine. And so this is a picture of a basking shark and one of our scientists that are in our research vessel. Um, you can see it's pretty large. That's it. This is its dorsal fin here. Um, the pectoral fin is here and its nose is kind of pointed at the boat. Um, they're actually animal. the second largest fish in the world. Is it 14, So this one is probably about, yeah, at least. So this one was probably, I would say 20 to 25 feet okay. in length. Um, My goodness. But yeah, so these are the second largest fish in the world, second to the whale shark. But like the whale shark, they are filter feeders. And so they feed on very small, uh, we call them zooplankton. They're just kind of small little crustacean-like creatures um, Specifically, uh, basking sharks feed on copepods, and so they're just kind of swimming through the bay, filter feeding uh, these little animals. But we got to tag these animals, and what's really interesting about this project is that in Canada they don't have they don't necessarily have um, buoys. So if you're out in the water, uh, the U.S. government puts out buoys that kind of monitor uh, water temperature. Huh. Um, throughout different seasons. And so most of those buoys are collecting data on that specific location, but the Canadian government doesn't have stuff like that currently. And so the project was essentially using these fish to monitor the health of the bay. And so what we did was we put tags on these sharks. And so not only could we learn about their biology, um, kind of like where they, they go and what they're doing um, during certain times of the year, we could also gather information about um, water depth and water temperature. So we can kind of track how the bay is changing, um, specifically with climate change, how the temperature of the bay changes over different years. The Bay of Fundy is the one that has the amazing tides, right? That mm -hmm. like the, the largest tides in the world. Largest tides in the world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, you yep. should check it out. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, definitely, definitely. Definitely check out the Bay of Fundy. Um, and so I have a video of us tagging a basking shark okay. here. And I can just play it. Um, but this is kind of like a typical day out on the boat when we're tagging. And so out here, this is the dorsal fin of a basking shark. And you can see it's not super big, but um, what we do is we're in the bay, usually when it's really calm, and once we see the fin, kind of protruding out of the water, they're basking sharks. And so most most of their day is spent basking at the water surface. Right. And so what we do is we locate them in the bay and then we kind of boat on over to them slowly, not to scare, not to scare them away because sometimes the boat um, motors will disturb the water just enough for them to react and dive. Um, but this instrument down here is essentially the tag. And so this yellow thing is the tag um, and that's what collects all of the data on, on water temperature, depth, and location. And so what we essentially do is we use this um, pole to puncture the dorsal fin because it's mostly made of cartilage. It's kind of like piercing your ear. Right. Um, it and so hurt we, them, right? we punch, no, yeah. So the dorsal fin doesn't really have many uh, blood vessels or nerves. And so that's really the spot where most people put tags on sharks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we tag the shark. You can see here, this is the tail, um, but this one's pretty large too. And so usually we can approach them pretty slowly. And so we'll tag them in the dorsal fin. Okay. There's the tag going on and you can see it kind of being trailed behind the animal. Um, and the tag will pop off in three days. And then we go, we have to go and retrieve it. So we'll have to, we use a satellite to retrieve yes. the tag. And then we can download all the data, see where the shark has been, um, and collect a lot of data that way. That's pretty so, cool. So, yeah. Um, so the tags, right? But I, I, I foresee that some kids are going to ask a question about the tags. 
so that how do they pop off? Yeah. Do they automatic release or is it like the line breaks after like or something like that? Or how does the tag come off? Yeah. It's, it's three days. <laughs> so the tag is actually like programmed for about three days. What happens is it's made of a magnesium metal. And so the salt in the water actually corrodes a part of the tag. And so it's it's attached by filament. And so this metal piece is in the middle of the tag and where the dorsal fin was um, punctured. And so after three days, the salt actually corrodes the tag off and it'll just pop off and it's buoyant. So it'll float to the top and then it has a little antenna that we can track it. And then we just go out on a boat and pick it up out of the water. There's a lot of engineering in your science. Lots, <laughs> lots of it, right? <laughs> That's why you're using the salt water. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And it's, it's fun because um, a lot of science is also about being able to build your own stuff. So all these tags are handmade. Um, so you need to figure out, we do a lot of experimentation with um, how the tag will trail on the dorsal fin, where we need to place it on the dorsal fin, um, like hydrodynamically, where it should be. As long, but we need to make sure it's not too heavy so that it doesn't actually like inhibit the animal from doing its normal everyday activities. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into like figuring out just what this big yellow blob is um, before we actually deploy it on an animal. Like a little submarine that trails um, on the animal. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And so just because we didn't have like a really cool uh, image of what the basking shark looked like from the front, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to play this video of a basking shark that's caught in a weir. Um, so this is actually a very common apparatus in the bay. Um, it's meant to trap fish, but here a basking shark is like swimming inside of it. And so I think they're just really cool creatures. They are. Um, their faces look kind of strange, but this kind of gives you an idea of what the face looks like. Let me ask you a question about I'm sharks. Sure Especially sharks are considered older on the other because of the type of tail that they have. Is this, is this one of those tails? So I'm not sure if there's actually any scientific evidence to prove uh, that the tail shape actually tells like the phylogenetic age kind of like through evolutionary history. Right. Um, I think it's more, I think it's more of like a, the morphology is suiting the function. This kind of goes back to like a functional morphology question. Right. Um, so the thresher shark, they, they have those tails that are pretty much over half the length of their body. So they have these really long, um, we call it it's the dorsal lobe of the tail. And so they're really long because these animals, one, swim really fast, but they think that they use the tail uh, specifically to stun prey. Oh. So they'll, they can like flip it really fast. Um, and they think that it's really used to like snap at a fish and it'll stun the fish so that the shark can come and eat it. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, but then like um, great white sharks, mako sharks, they all kind of have that similar, almost like it looks like a fish. The the two right. lobes are almost the same in length. And they think that's because that, that tail is more built for um, fast swimmers. So they actually maneuver it like a more. Like tuna. tuna has the same kind of tail, really, right? Yes, right? exactly. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so they're more, they're made, they're built for higher speed. Yeah, oh. exactly. Okay, so are there other ways that biology can be applied to human life? Yeah, so my current project is actually looking at, again, another tissue. I'm a functional morphologist, so we love to look at different tissues of organisms. Um, so I'm looking at the skin currently of different species of sharks. And so for those of you that may not know, the skin is actually covered in thousands of scales. Um, these are called placoid scales. They're different than the scales that you see in fish because these are actually, we call them small teeth um, because they're actually made of enamel and dentin. So the same stuff that's in your teeth are what, comp are what comprise these scales. Um, and so it's always interesting and fun to say, oh, well, sharks are covered in thousands of tiny teeth because they essentially are, um, but they're very tiny. So this picture here shows a finger and this is one um, scale. It's called a denticle is what we actually call them. One denticle um, from a mako shark. 
And so they're really tiny, but they cover the entire body of a shark. Every single shark is covered in these denticles. And what's really interesting about this is that all of the denticles differ between species. And so they are different, um, the denticles are different shapes. And we, as scientists, hypothesize that these different shapes are kind of what enable these animals to swim efficiently through the water. Huh. And so what do I mean by that? Um, so here we have an Atlantic shark, no shark. These are what their denticles look like. And you can see they've got um, ridges. Um, these lines here are ridges. Um, and you can compare that to a basking shark shown here where there aren't many ridges and these are kind of like um, triangular pokey looking denticles. And the difference here is that basking sharks don't really swim very fast. Um, and so we hypothesize that these ridges actually might enable um, fluid to pass over the body more efficiently and effectively to enable wow. animals that have these types of denticles to swim faster. Um, more examples of that would be in the mako shark, which is one of the fastest swimming sharks. Um, they have these ridges too, but their denticles are a little bit smaller than the sharp nose shark. And then these are denticles from the great white shark. And so you can see there's also ridging here, um, but they're all different shapes. Um, every species has its own shape, which is really fascinating. So what we have been doing is uh, printing. So what we do is we look at these denticles and we can actually print them. Uh, we can 3D print the denticles. Uh, we can make them really big. So here's an example. I have the denticles. This is of the sharp nose shark here. These are printed and they're enlarged. So we can actually see um, the different kinds of characteristics of these denticles. So these are the ridges that I was talking about um, that help flow um, more effectively go around the shark's body. Um, so these are printed really large, but we can also print um, smaller ones. And so what we actually use in the flow tank to look at water flow around the denticles, um, we use a foil like this, which is very flexible. And so what we do is we attach it to a machine that will like flap it. It's called the flapper actually. <laughs> um, so this machine will flap this foil through the water. And if you can see, these are really tiny denticles, 3D printed. Um, these are almost to scale, but they're still much larger than the actual denticle. These are actually um, mako sharks, so what's on this, the finger. Um, these are mako shark denticles that we've actually put in the flow tank uh, to test how water moves around them. And so it's, it's always really fun to be involved in projects that not only encompass biology, but then again, you can get kind of engineers involved. And so a lot of this research is used to see kind of like, what is the optimal shape and size of the denticle? And so then people can 3D print them and put them on things like the propellers of boats um, or fans, underwater, underwater instruments that um, would need to minimize the amount of energy that is used to operate them. And so by attaching these to propellers, you can move faster, but not use as much energy. Now, this is just an aside. I'm actually, I'm actually thinking that like, for the faster sharks, they, they move from mm -hmm. side to side as they swim, right? And the, do the denticles mm -hmm. actually play a part in their motion, uh, in, in the actual movement through the water, right? Because they, they flex, right? So yes. are they actually involved yeah, in their so swimming? They probably are a little bit, right? I would think so. I mean, yeah. we don't really know where this is like a very big field of study currently, um, especially in our lab. And we we know that sharks have these denticles. We know that they differ not only across species, but they also differ across different parts of the body. Mm. And so denticles on the nose are different in shape than denticles on the tail. And so we would hypothesize that, yes, some of these denticles must play a part in either how the shark is moving or again, how water is flowing over them um, just because they're super flexible and the skin on sharks are is already very flexible anyway. So the skin that's underneath these scales is very flexible to enable that sh the sharks to move the way that they do. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that we're investigating currently. Yeah, also I knew, I've known about denticles for a long time, like the teeth of the kid. But I didn't know that they were mm -hmm. so high from the actual surface of the shark, you know, that they grew out so far. 
which is probably not as much yeah. represented, but it looks like quite a distance. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. so some of water them are flow, like- Water will flow through them too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we have like the surface kind of um, environment, but then there's also like, we don't know what's going on kind of like in here, because obviously right. they're not tight, they're tightly packed, but they're not dense enough that water wouldn't be able to flow through, say like, in the skin here. Right, um, it's, it's very interesting. So, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting field of study. It's cool. cool. And sharks have so much hidden anyway. It's like, well, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of, because we don't know too much about them yet. We are learning about them. So there's, a, there's exactly. they discover things about them all the time. Yeah. Um, yes. I should also, uh, I guess we should also say something about the fact that they're endangered, right? Because they are, a lot of them. Yes. Not all of them. There's a lot of sharks. It's called, but but some of the bigger ones are endangered, right? So. Yeah. yeah, there are there are there are many sharks. I think there currently are at least over two hundred species of sharks that could be definitely under um, estimated. But there there are a lot of shark species out there, and many that we haven't um, discovered yet. Many deep sea sharks, people just don't know about them because it's an environment that's really hard to get to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some of these sharks are definitely on the endangered species list uh basking sharks in particular um are one of the yeah are one of the one of them that are not highly endangered i'm not sure exactly what what level they are but they're definitely their populations are definitely not as high as they should be um and i think it's just because sometimes they get um because they're so big if they get stuck in like a, a boating channel or something um they but they're not necessarily hit. hunted for food. It might be definitely, um, yeah. and so we've actually seen that with our study. Um, so they'll follow the food, and many years the copepod abundance is actually very low in the bay, and we don't see many sharks when we're out there. And so you can assume that they're not there because their food isn't there, um, and so that can also be a reason why their populations might be dwindling. What kind of advice would you give a child who's interested in becoming a marine biologist? So I always say that I love to kind of quote my master's mentor um, who always says, you're not doing science if you're not having fun. And so I think that no matter what you're doing, science is, can always be a really fun thing. And to be a marine biologist, I always like to stress that you don't have to be near the ocean to be a marine biologist. You don't have to be scuba certified. I'm actually not scuba certified. Um, many research happens. I know many research happens in the lab um, or on boats. Um, but I guess that's something I would really like to stress is that don't don't be afraid that if you're not any of those things, you can't become a marine biologist. Um, but you know, the, the funny part yeah. is I've had I've had um, most of the scientists I talked to had said you have to have an interest in and learning about the world around you, right? Which is pretty obvious, yeah. right? But if you're not mm -hmm. interested, what's the point, right? Right? <laughs> it's right. true. So that that's always something that comes up. The other the other thing they always said is um, you need to know about the, the topic. So you should like like read into it as much as possible, do research ahead of time, you know? Like you, yeah, have, to, yeah. you have to have an interest in the actual topic, which makes sense, you know? Uh, right. I like the fact that you said you don't have to be scuba certified because I think that's the first thing people think of. When they think of marine biologists, is that yet yeah, you? Know, I have to jump into the water with the shark. No, no. <laughs> There's a lot no, of no, um, no. Stony, well, we have Stony Brook University here, which is well known for its. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not marine biology; it's marine sciences, really. Which is the whole other aspect of like you know they study they study the ocean, but not necessarily the organisms in it. You know, it could be actually sure. like the climate and, and uh, which is. I showed you all the video of us tagging basking sharks. Um, but what's really interesting about the basking sharks is for some reason, they seem to like the prop wash. So the water that comes off of the back of our boat. And so oftentimes, this is kind of terrifying, but often after tagging the sharks, they would dive. And so normally we stay in the area and we'll, we'll go and look for them just to see where they pop up and just to make sure the tag is still on. But sometimes they'll, <laughs> they'll emerge kind of like on the back of our boat. And so if we're slowly going, if, if we're slowly going through the water,
after tagging a shark and we kind of like look behind us, sometimes we see the dorsal fin kind of like coming the up boat. behind the boat and just following, <laughs> which is terrifying because the sharks are huge and our boat is only about 17 feet long. Um, so most times the sharks are bigger than the boat, um, oh, but they yeah. seem to like that prop wash. I don't know if they like it going across their face or what, oh. but they always, they oftentimes come up right behind the boat after we tag them. Could it have something to do with the fact that the propeller is propelling those those, those microscopic, you know, that they mm. eat towards them? They might have something yeah. like that, right? Maybe. <laughs> it could I be should be real. I, I want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I always wanted to be a marine biologist. I really did. What made you interested <laughs> in becoming a marine biologist? <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because I grew up in a landlocked state, so I'm from Pennsylvania, but I've always had this deep love of the ocean. And I think what really drove my love of the ocean was that there was, even though we know a lot and we've been learning a lot more about the ocean and the organisms that live in it, there's still much stuff, there's still so much stuff that people don't know. There's a lot of unknown. Um, and I think it's really fascinating that something that encompasses so much of the world and that so many people work on and study um, that we just we still don't know as much about it as, say, terrestrial organisms or things that aren't that don't make up as much of the Earth. Um, and I think it's really cool that one, we don't know a lot about it, but two, there's so much to study. There's so many different aspects of the ocean, not not just sharks, not just fish, um, marine mammals, but also the plants that make up the ocean. Um, kind of how invertebrates like algae and those types of things kind of interact with the whole ecosystem and how um, quickly it can change, not only by like natural impacts, but also by human impacts as well. Um, and so I think those are kinds of the things that really fascinate me and got me really interested in marine biology. Um, not only for my own individual purpose, but kind of like how the entire world utilizes the things that um, grow in the ocean and things that we can harvest from it too. What I always think is interesting is there's a quote that I read all the time that it is easier for us now to go into space than it is to go to the bottom of the ocean. Of that is so true. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, interesting, right? The it's last so frontier. <laughs> it will be the last frontier. <laughs> it really is. And it, it's amazing how many unique organisms can live down there from, like sharks live down there, different kinds of fish, like the angler fish that have the little probe on their head, like from Finding Nemo. Um, and it's, there's such a diversity of animals that live in the deep ocean, just as you would see in like a coastal environment, like off the beach. Right. Um, and so I think that's really cool. And the whole other discussion is the, the black smokers and things like that. The fact that the animals are living off of different chemical compounds than the rest of the animals on earth. It's a whole different like environment, right? That's yeah, crazy. exactly. So it's, thank yeah, you very much so for doing this interview. <laughs> thank you for having me. Kids, if you have any questions that you would like to forward to Molly, please send them to reference at elwoodlibrary.org and check the end of the video for links for more interest about the subject. Thank you very much.